Welcome back, everyone. My guest today is Dr. Walter Block, a professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans. He went to school with Bernie Sanders, and he's the author of several libertarian philosophy and economics books, most notably a set called Defending the Undefendable, where he lays out acts which may be socially unacceptable or morally corrupt, but which should not be punishable in court. I want to caveat that while I disagree with Dr. Block's methods to arrive at his conclusions, he's obviously coming at these questions as an atheist. I just wanted to note that we do have a striking amount of overlap as to things that shouldn't be punished. Some things we touch on are of a disturbing nature, nothing graphic, but I do want to mention that some vocabulary words do come up which may prompt hard questions from children or Google searches which they may not be ready for. With that said, let's begin. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. I happen to be an atheist, but I am a pro-religious atheist. Why am I a pro-religious atheist? Because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And who was my main enemy? Uh, the Soviet Union, uh, China, uh, the totalitarians. And how did they treat religion? Not too well. So I am in favor of religion. Uh, my daughter is a uh, Baptist, um, uh, believing, uh, very serious about that. And um, my wife and my son and I are, are not. But, you know, uh, uh, that's just, you know, um, you like Mozart, I like Bach. Um, <laughs> you know, no real big deal. Uh, I'm a libertarian, and I look at everything uh, through the eyeglasses of libertarianism. And is religion, per se, a violation of rights? Of course not. Therefore, uh, it's a perfectly acceptable uh, sort of a thing. You know, I was just thinking, I'm writing my book, Defending the Undefendable Three, and I didn't put the religious person in there. I'm going to, thanks to you, I'm going to stick the religious person in there, because the religious person doesn't violate rights and yet is... Uh, reviled and hated and, you know, uh, jumped down the, the throat of and all that. So um, I, I thank you for that. So um, could you tell me a little bit of background, uh, like how did you come to your current position? And I have heard that you were a uh, fellow classmates with Bernie Sanders. Yeah, Bernie and I were buddies. Uh, we were on the track team together. We went to walk to school and back from school because we both lived in the same quadrant away from Madison High School. Uh, the joke I tell is that Bernie Sanders doesn't run away from much. He doesn't run away from socialism. He doesn't run away from letting not ex-convicts, but convicts uh, vote. Uh, he doesn't run away from too much, but he ran away from me because he was one of the best runners in the city and I was a mediocre runner. So we'd line up uh, on, on the starting line and then he'd run away from me. So my views were roughly the same as his, although I was more interested in girls and sports and he was 
political even even then. And then Ayn Rand came to Brooklyn College to speak, and I came to boo her because she, you know, favored free enterprise, and everyone knows that free enterprise uh, leads to poverty and you know evil, and it's just obnoxious. And uh, after the um, after the presentation, uh, there was a luncheon in her honor. And there was this long table. She was sitting at the head of it with Nathaniel Brandon and Alan Peacock and uh, 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 several of her uh, chief uh, people there. And I was relegated to the other side of the table. And I turned to my neighbor and said, you know, this capitalism has got to go. Socialism is the way. And he said, well, I don't really know that much about it, but the people at the other end do. Uh, Alan Greenspan was there, later head of the Fed. And uh, Brandon was very nice. Uh, I put my head in between his and hers on Rand and said, look, we have no room at this end of the table, but I'll come to the other end of the table and talk to you under two conditions. One, you have to promise to keep this debate going until we settle it and don't just like a, make it a one-shot deal. And two, you have to read two books that I'll recommend. Well, the two books were Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. I read the books. I came to Ein's house and... Um, um, Brandon's house, and I was converted after a whole month or two or three. And then I, uh, I, I wasn't really um, uh, a Randian, a sort of cultish, but uh, I certainly favored free enterprise. I was limited government free enterprise, uh, like uh, Henry Hazlitt or Ayn Rand. So that's how I got into it. And then I finally met Murray Rothbard, and then, uh, uh, then I became an anarcho-capitalist. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything. And uh, one of my books was on privatizing roads, because as you say, a lot of people say, well, yeah, I favor free enterprise, but who's going to build the roads? I mean, we need highways. We need streets. Uh, another one was we have to private all rivers, lakes, and oceans. And a third book in this series is we have to privatize uh, the space race getting to the moon and, and when we get there and Mars and, you know, privatize that as well. And uh, also another book is on environmentalism. You know, the, the reason we have problems with um, species extinction is because they're not private. If the, um, I, I compare the, uh, the cow and the buffalo, they're the same animal. A biologist will have to excuse me. I'm an economist. What do I know? Uh, they're the same animal, big, fat, you know, uh, if they hit one of them, you know, you're in trouble. And yet one never came within a million miles of extinction, the cow, and the other was almost extinct, the buffalo. What's the big difference? Well, the cow was always privately owned and the buffalo was never allowed to be pri privately owned for a long time in which case the buffalo almost went extinct. So here are four examples where privatization uh, is a good thing, promotes what most people want, even our friends on the left. Uh, they don't want as many people killed on the highways as are now killed, something like 38, 39, 40,000 people a year die on the highways. Uh, you can't tell me that Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders uh, want that. But uh, we have different ways of reducing deaths, and my way or our way is privatization of the roads and allowing some competition. So there's a lot of um, similarity about the goals and the ends, but the means are 180 degrees wide from libertarians and, um, and the commies. Yeah, it sort of seems like the whole issue is about who manages things. If somebody can be, whether the person's allowed to be held accountable or not is a big deal. A very, very big deal. I mean, the, the whole point, I mean, the post office, uh, the U.S. post office, uh, nobody's accountable. If they lose money, they, they just get more money from taxes. Whereas if uh, FedEx uh, doesn't do too well or if um, Burger King doesn't do too well, they're very accountable. Uh, they lose money, they go broke. You know, where is Pan Am? Where is uh, uh, Nash Rambler? Uh, th these are companies that were very big and they didn't do a good job and, and they disappeared. Uh, so accountability is crucial. So pivoting a little bit about your, your book that you're writing, you're writing a third version of Defending the Undefendable. Can you tell me a little bit about that uh, idea? And I can either, I've got the list pulled up here for the first version of it, unless you'd prefer to read it. I've got the first two versions right here because I'm working on the third and I have to figure out what I put in the first two so I don't, <laughs> I don't repeat myself. Why don't you read the... Uh... 
So you defend the prostitute, the pimp, the male chauvinist pig, the drug pusher, the drug addict, the blackmailer, the slanderer or libeler, the denier of academic freedom, the advertiser, the person who yells fire in a crowded theater, the gypsy cab driver, the ticket scalper, the dishonest cop, the non-government counterfeiter, the miser, the inheritor, the money lender, the non-contributor to charity, the curmudgeon, the slumlord, the ghetto merchant, the speculator, the importer, the middleman, the profiteer, the strip miner, the litterer, the waste makers, the fat capitalist pig employer, the scab, the rate buster, the employer of child labor. So somebody says to you, Walter, I'm sure you've never gotten this question. How can you possibly speak anything positive about any of these people? Well, uh, let me read the, the uh, this is the second one. Uh, the second in the series. Uh, I'll read these and then I'll answer your question. Uh, here we have um, the multinational enterprise of the smuggler, British Petroleum, nuclear energy, corporate raider, hatchet man, home worker, picket line crosser, daycare provider, automator, smoker, human organ merchant, breast milk substitute purveyor, topless in public, polygamous marriage, burning bed, the sexist, peeping Tom, ageist, homophobe, stereotyper, war toy manufacturer, colorizer of movies, baby seller, heritage building destroyer, bad Samaritan, dualist, executioner, dwarf thrower, and intellectual property denier. Now, what, what all these have in common is two things. One, they don't violate rights. Not a one of them. Notice I don't have the murderer. I don't have the rapist. I don't have the thief. I don't have the arsonist. I don't have the kidnapper. Uh, none of that. So uh, none of them violate the, the libertarian code of, um, of non-aggression. And all of them are either illegal or hated by everybody or by everyone who counts, like the New York Times or Washington Post. So that's what all these have in common. And I'm defending the su supposed undefendable, but I think they're actually um, defensible or defendable. Uh, and the reason is because they don't violate rights. And if they don't, look, I don't favor prostitution. Uh, I mentioned I have a daughter. I wouldn't want her to be a prostitute, God forbid. But if she were, I wouldn't want to go to jail for consensual adult behavior. So I don't favor these things. I just favor the legalization of them. And I think that a lot of them can be defended in various ways. It's so interesting. And I obviously don't agree with mo with a, a couple of these, but I haven't necessarily thought through them all. Uh, I, I've only read part of the first book. I need to read both of them. Uh, but most of them, it's it's kind of astounding to me how how an atheist can come to what I think are biblical conclusions on a lot of matters that I think your typical you know Christian or religious person in the United States at least would scoff at and obviously call you all sorts of names and not ha want to have anything to do with you just based on your the way that you think. Well, you know, I am Jewish, and I used to be friends who uh, passed away with a Hasidic rabbi. And what we would discuss is the Talmud versus libertarianism. We found a lot of uh, overlap. And, you know, Jesus was one of us, not one of you people. He never converted to Christianity. He was, <laughs> he was Jewish. And um, uh, I don't know, there is uh, an overlap between Judaism, Judaism and, and Christianity. And there is a, a relationship between the two religions and libertarianism. So it shouldn't be a total surprise that there are similarities. Uh, give me an example of one or two or three of the ones we don't agree with me. I'll try to convert you to the one true faith. <laughs> okay, I, I appreciate that. I love some friendly competition. Yeah, yeah. I would say this the strip miner, but I would kind of modify it. Um, I'm sure you're aware, biblically, like there's the concept of gleaning. Um, you know, people are supposed to allow the, the edges of their fields to be unharvested for the poor to come and, and have enough to survive. So in one sense, I disagree, but in another sense, I agree because in the Bible, there's not a, there's not a criminal penalty listed. If you fail to do it, it's sort of like, you know, God will judge you if you don't do this and you know, your, your nation will topple or suffer the economic consequences of it. But there wasn't, you know, a policeman that was designated to go around and arrest you for failing to do it. So in that sense, and I think you do, you do kind of, um, address it. So I know I'm not, I guess, out, outright disagreeing with you because you're, you're, you posit that these aren't necessarily moral things. These are all legal, you know, what should the legal penalties be? 
So um, th- that was sort of that was my f- the first thing that jumped out at me. Right. Well, uh, you make a very good point about morality. Uh, libertarianism and mor- libertarianism is a small slice of morality. Think of morality as a big pizza pie, and libertarianism is one slice of it. For example, uh, honoring your mother and your father. Um, it's a virtuous thing, but if you don't do it, you shouldn't be put in jail. And libertarianism is only a theory of should you be put in jail or when is violence justified? And it only asks that one question, when is violence justified? It only gives one answer in defense or retaliation or punishment against a, 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 a criminal. And that's it. So we don't really get into morality. Now, take the non-contributor to charity who doesn't allow for gleaning. Did he violate rights? He didn't violate rights, therefore it should be legal. So I only defend them in the sense that they're legal. Uh, but I think it's moral to give charity. I give charity myself, and there's nothing wrong with it, and, and there's some, a lot to be said in favor of it. But if you don't, uh, should you uh, be, uh, in, you know, in the Christmas Carol, who, who's the bad guy? Um, the Scrooge. 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 Not Scrooge McDuck. Well, Scrooge McDuck too, but Scrooge. Well, uh, you know, Scrooge is a... Um, a benefactor of society because he made a lot of money. And the only way you can make a lot of money in the free enterprise system is by promoting other people's welfare. Serving serving customers. Yeah, the pleasing customers and, and uh, you know, buying low and selling high and, and promoting uh, uh, a prosperity. So uh, it would be nice if after, I mean, uh, take Bill uh, Gates. Bill Gates um, um, uh, promoted prosperity in a magnificent way when he worked for Microsoft. Afterward, he um, gave to charity. But suppose he never gave to charity. Suppose he only, um, uh, you know, uh, stayed at Microsoft. Would he? He might have even been more of a benefactor. Or compare him with uh, Mother Teresa, who helped society more: Bill Gates when he was working at Microsoft, or Mother Teresa? Well, Mother Teresa was a good guy, you know. I'm not against her, but Bill Gates, um, you know. Uh, uh, contributed magnificently to society. So uh, charity is, is good, but um, uh, if you don't give to charity, that's okay, even though you are condemned uh, uh, viciously by most people for not. You know, Henry Ford, you know, he makes cars, and somebody said, well, at some point you have too much money and you shouldn't, you sh- anything else that you make should go to, you know, some charitable fund or something like that. And it And it presumes that uh, you got the money by not helping people. Uh, what's poker um, uh, where the winnings of the winner equals the losing of the loser? Oh, yeah, fixed pie or a zero-sum? A zero-sum game. That's what I was looking for. I'm getting seen on. I'm forgetting my marbles here. Uh, zero-sum. It assumes that capitalism is like a zero-sum game. When I bought this shirt for 10 bucks, I uh, gained at the expense of the seller or vice versa. No, it's not a, a, a zero-sum game. It's a positive-sum game. Both sides gain. I gained because I valued the shirt more than 10 bucks. The guy who sold me the shirt that, uh, gained because he valued it at less than 10 bucks, and we each made a profit. Now, the Marxists would say we exploited each other, but that's silly. Yeah, it's like people use the pie analogy, but the funny thing about pies is that you can make more of them. Right. Now, look, the game Monopoly, that is a zero-sum game. When you land on the park place with a hotel on it and you pay a thousand bucks or whatever it is, you lose and they gain. But when you go to a motel and you pay a hundred bucks for for the night to stay in a motel, you gain because you value uh, the thing more than a hundred and they gain because they value it less than Yeah, having a place to stay for the night, that's worth something. In Monopoly, it's, oh, well, I must stay somewhere. And so this is just an expense. There's no, it's not, it's not a positive thing for me to stay here. Right. There it is a zero sum game. But the, but Monopoly is not like the free enterprise system. Uh, you don't have winners. Well, you, sometimes you have losers, but uh, not really. Uh, the, the rule is the market benefits all participants. Now, take the case of the blacksmith when Henry Ford came along with the car. The blacksmith before the car was, you know, a very wealthy guy, uh, uh, looked up to and did an important job. And all of a sudden... He can't get a job because uh, very few people are using horses a few years later. So the question is, well, didn't the market hurt him? And the answer is he's no longer a market participant. A market participant is somebody who has to 
make an offer that somebody else wants. Look, I now I'm going to offer you this pen. It's a very nice pen for a million dollars. Want to buy this pen? No, thank you. Not for a million. What? What? You don't want to buy this pen, you rotten kid? Well, am I a market participant when I offered this pen for a million dollars? No, I'm not a market participant. So the blacksmith used to be a market participant before Henry Ford came along. But now he's not. He has to go and uh, go and work in the car factory or become a car mechanic or, or whatever. And then again, he becomes a market participant. And then he gains again. And every market participant gains in the ex ante sense. Ex post, sometimes you regret buying this shirt or whatever. But uh, usually you gain ex post as well. Another interesting thing is the the idea of the prostitute. Because, you know, I think most people would kind of be in shock and awe that a Christian can in any sense think that prostitution is not the worst thing in the world. But it also, biblically speaking, it does depend on whether the person's married or not. Because if you're married, okay, and you've agreed not to cheat on somebody, that's one thing, because now you've entered into a voluntary marriage agreement. But then the prostitute, you know, some orphan girl that has no parents, nobody, like she's, you know, she could prostitute herself, and that's treated biblically very differently than somebody who's married. Well, the way I see it, it's not really good. I, I don't go to prostitutes. I wouldn't want my son to go to a prostitute. I, I wish prostitution would end. But what we're talking about is should it be criminalized? Should somebody that's, be punished by other people to do it? Yeah. Precisely. And I think that every Christian or every Jew or every religious person or every moral person might agree that a world would be a better place if there were no prostitution, other things equal. But should they go to jail for this? That's the issue. And I, I don't see why a Christian can say, well, I oppose prostitution. I think it's the wrong way to act. The people should act in a different way than uh, paying money for sex. But should they go to jail? No. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying prostitution is good. And it, it's a hard distinction for a lot of people to make. They think that if you don't want them to go to jail, then you favor the thing. No. Well, you just don't want them to go to jail. Yeah. It's very different than than favoring them. It's also interesting because I don't think that there's necessarily a good place for jail, at, at least in terms of how the Bible speaks. There's other punishments for everything. It's either you pay back what you stole. You don't go to jail at the person's expense that you stole from because that just makes it worse. That's for sure. Well, when I say jail, I'm speaking loosely. You're, you're not uh, violence is not used against you. Obviously, the way we now have it is, you know, I rob you and then I go to jail and, and then uh, it costs 80000 a year to keep me in jail and you have to pay me again. First, I robbed you and, and now you have to pay again through taxes to keep me in jail. No, the, the whole point of a jail should be to make sure that I pay you back and that I don't run away. So if I, uh, you know, set fire to your car and I owe you 30000 bucks and I don't have it, well, I should be... Uh, compelled to engage in forced labor until I pay you that what I owe you. Now, I think it's more than 30000 but that's a different issue. And the only reason we would have a jail is to make sure I don't run away. But apart from that, if somehow we stipulate I'm not running away, well, then I don't have to, I don't have to go to jail. I just have to work uh, long, hard hours to pay you back that 30000 and more. Tell me a little bit about the story of how you, you wrote these and are writing the next one. Well, the way I wrote the first one, I was writing my PhD dissertation on um, rent control at Columbia to get my PhD, and it was boring. All I did was econometrics, and yeah. So I, I would promise myself, if I just did this equation or I just did that little bit, I could take a whole day off and do whatever I wanted. So, you know, I took a whole day off and I wrote about the yelling fire in a crowded theater. And then I did back to the dissertation, and then I wrote about blackmail, uh, legalizing blackmail. And, and then by the time I finished my dissertation, I had 35 um, essays. And I put them together in a book, and uh, or put them together, and I tried to get them published as a book, and I got it. And uh, there was this guy, Rodriguez, who was a cartoonist. And you'll see the cartoons in the book, and he was just a magnificent cartoonist. So I got him to illustrate um, uh, the, the chapters. And uh, this one also has cartoons in it. Um, there, there are some cartoons you could see um, in, in this version, version two. And in version three, there are more cartoons. So each chapter has a cartoon or two. Not every chapter, but many of the chapters have cartoons. So that's how I started writing it. The second one, I, I forget how I did that. Uh, I, just, I just, you know, 
I write a lot, and every once in a while, I, I, uh, there's a certain theme, namely hated and don't violate rights. So, um, you know, the dwarf thrower. You know, dwarf throwing isn't good. But, you know, uh, if a dwarf agrees to be thrown and he's paid uh, briskly for it, shouldn't go to jail. Uh, he, he might be embarrassed. He might not want his kids to see what, what's being happening to him. But, you know, uh, they're paid very well. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. No one's compelling them to do it. So that would be uh, yet another example. I forget which book that one is in, but uh, that's one of the chapters. What do you see are some of the biggest things you see affecting a change in people's thinking towards these ideals? Um, do you And can you think of anything practical that your average working person could do to move the world in, in more of this direction of thinking? Well, you know, now you're asking what's the best way to promote people to liberty or to introduce people to liberty. And the way I answer that is I say, who are the two most successful people in converting masses of people to libertarianism? And the answer are Ayn Rand for my generation, who wrote novels and was sort of nasty personally, and Ron Paul, who would probably uh, affect your generation. He was almost the opposite, sort of a sweetie pie. I mean, if you called Ayn Rand a sweetie pie, she's going to smack you in the face. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> with a wet fish or something. Uh, so what I get from this is there's no one right way to do it. Because uh, the two of them are almost polar opposites in terms of personality. I mean, Ron Paul is a sweetie pie. He's so gentle and nice. Ayn Rand is just about the opposite. Uh, one was a novelist, one was a politician, and, and then a uh, public speaker, uh, which he's now doing. So there's no one right way to do it. Uh, you're doing it maybe through Christianity, and and uh, you would be able to convert people who are Christians and not libertarians in a much better way than I could, because you know the lingo, you know what the concerns, you know the Bible better than I do. So you know uh, the way you do it should be the way you are doing, it. and the way I do it, I do it. I'm a professor of economics, so I uh, I do it through uh, that vehicle. So I, I, to answer your question, I don't think there's any one right way to do it or one best way to do it. We each should do it in our own way. Uh, for example, the um, Free State Project in um, New Hampshire. You've heard of I've, I've heard of it. I'm not familiar with it. Well, uh, the whole bunch of people decided let's uh, let's all, let's all libertarians move to a, a, a very unpopulated state. We will have more of an effect than in Illinois or California or New York. So they got the 10 states with the least population, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, New Hampshire, and a few others. And then they had a vote as to which one you're going to go to. And they all said, if we ever get 20,000 people, then you're obligated morally, not legally, morally to go there. But um, I think the last two standing were Wyoming and New Hampshire. And uh, finally, New Hampshire got the nod. They never had 20,000, but people started moving to New Hampshire. So that's one way of promoting liberty, because if you have a lot of people in, in a state like that, you can make more waves than, than in um, you know, a state like Texas, where there are many more people. Another way is uh, each state has a think tank. You know, uh, New Orleans, uh, Louisiana has the Pelican Institute. Uh, uh, various states have different institutes that try to focus on local state issues and try to show that free enterprise will solve the state problems. And then there's national think tanks like the Mises Institute, my favorite, and also Reason and um, uh, Cato and, and several others. Uh, so there are many, many ways, many roads toward liberty and many ways to try to convert people to liberty. And my advice is do the one that's the most fun. Because, you know, you're supposed to have fun in life and, and, uh, and probably you'll be more effective and you'll have less burnout if you're enjoying what you do. And if you're enjoying what you do, you should do what you like to do. So in other words, just get started. Do something. Do whatever. Speak to whatever audience you have the quickest access and best access to. Right. Uh, a lot of libertarians, what they'll do is they'll go to gun clubs. Uh, uh, gun sales. And, and they'll show the, uh, what's that, the libertarian thing with the... Um, the, the two by two matrix, I forget what it's called, um, the Nolan chart. Oh, yeah, the, the X and Y axis. 
Right. Nolan chart, N-O-L-A-N, he started that chart. And that's a good way. If you're into guns, go to a, a gun thing. If you're into gardening, go to a, a gardening club and, and show why libertarianism is better for gardening. Homesteading and uh, cottage food laws. There you go. There you go. There's a friend of mine who's a vegan. And he goes to vegan meetings and tries to promote uh, libertarianism among vegans. He doesn't succeed that well, but, you know, that's his thing. And, you know, God bless. So is there a particular one of these topics in Defending the Undefendable that you find gets the most pushback or the most engagement for whatever reason? Well, there are two that I would sing, uh, sing, uh, single out. One is um, counterfeiting counterfeit money. Or the counterfeiter and you mentioned bob murphy and uh, bob murphy and um uh, laura davidson and um matt mckay uh each wrote critical articles about that chapter see most libertarians agree with what i'm doing whether it's their thing or not that's different uh i mean the lefties say every chapter is evil and you know free enterprise is evil and you know what can you do but here were people who were very staunch libertarians and um uh, I think all three of them are co-authors of mine on, on other issues. And they disagree with me on counterfeiting counterfeit money. See, what I say is if you're going to counterfeit legitimate money, you're a criminal. It's fraud. And legitimate money is gold. But the, the folding money that we now have is counterfeit money. So if you counterfeit that, uh, it shouldn't be illegal. And, and, and uh, Murphy and Davidson and Mackay uh, all disagreed with me. And they wrote articles in uh, referee journals. And I wrote an article back. And, you know, we, we got it on. But it was a very friendly uh, debate, like you and I are having a friendly debate. Uh, no, none of those three were saying, well, you know, Block is an idiot or, you know, he's crazy. He's constructive this, criticism. Yeah. Yeah, constructive criticism, and then I uh, try to say why they were wrong, and, and I was right. So that's one chapter. Another chapter is the blackmailer, and um, you, you have to distinguish between a blackmail and extortion. And uh, in both cases, in, in the case of blackmail and in the case of extortion, uh, they have two things, a threat coupled with a demand for money or sexual services or something. So... Uh, if I'm going to blackmail you, I'm going to say, well, um, I saw you cheating on your exam. And if you don't give me money, I'm going to tell the dean of your school that you cheated on the exam and they'll kick you out of school. So give me a hundred bucks. That would be blackmail. The threat is to talk, to be a gossip. Now, extortion is very different. Extortion is, I also have a threat and a demand for money. But the extortion is, if you don't give me money, I'll shoot you. Or I'll kill your kids or, you know, something uh, which would be uh, contrary to libertarianism, whereas gossip is not contrary to libertarianism. So all I'm doing when I'm blackmailing you is I'm threatening to talk. And, you know, we have uh, freedom of speech and I'm allowed to talk. Look, we don't put people in jail for gossiping. Why should we put people for, in jail for gossiping or, uh, and demanding money not to gossip? Right. And, and all the blackmail is threatening is to be a gossip. And if gossip is OK, then to be, look, I now threaten that I'm going to wear this blue shirt. Should I go to jail for that threat? No, because it's uh, legitimate to wear a blue shirt. You're wearing one, too. Although my you is better than yours. My, my blue shirt. Better than you. <laughs> I'm just being silly. Uh, the key is uh, what is the threat? If the threat is a legitimate thing like to talk to your dean about your cheating uh, in, in the exam or whatever it is, well, that shouldn't be against the law. And uh, what happens, I wrote a whole bunch of articles about blackmail, and then I have a whole book on that. Because there was once this conference, I think it was at the University of Chicago somewhere, where a whole bunch of mainstream legal theorists were getting together, and they all said, well, blackmail has to, has to go. Blackmail is uh, evil, it should be against the law. And then they diverged into two groups. One said it was um, pragmatic or utilitarian. The reason blackmail is no good is because uh, it hurts people. And the other was saying it's deontological because there's something intrinsically wrong with it. And I said, no, 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 it should be legalized. So I, I wrote a, a response to each and every one of those articles. And now I had enough for a whole book. And now one of my books is on the legalization of blackmail. Well, there's a lot of things that as soon as you start accepting money for it that the government wants to get involved in one way or another, whether it's food 
you know, if it's a potluck and everybody, there's no money changing hands, then you can uh, make food available to the public as long as you don't charge for it. But as soon as you accept a penny for it, now you're engaging, you need licensing and have to go through all these legal hoops to be able to offer that. Let's suppose I need a kidney and you're a nice guy. You, you have two of them and you donate one to me. Everything's fine. But now you say, well, give me 30,000 bucks for, for the kidney. And all of a sudden it's not good. The only thing that changed was that money changed hands. But I mean, if the thing is intrinsically evil, then then you ought to be put in jail for giving me the kidney in the first place. Or me, uh, and by put in jail, I mean be punished. Uh, so, and it's the same with prostitution. Uh, a man and a woman go to bed, uh, and let's say they're not married, and, and it, well, it's technically against the law of fornication, but nobody's going to be going to jail or being punished for going to bed on a voluntary basis. But now money changes hands and all of a sudden uh, everything changes. Why? Why just because money changes hands? Does that convert a, a, an entirely legitimate activity into something that's illicit? It, it's just the hatred for, for finance, a hatred for, for, for commerce. Yeah. Well, in Christianity, it, uh, the Bible distinguishes between if the the girl was a daughter of a priest or was an Israelite versus versus not. One of the Ten Commandments is don't lust after your neighbor's wife. Mm -hmm. Don't right? covet your neighbor's wife. Yeah. Right. Well, from a libertarian point of view, you can lust and covet all you want. Just keep your midst to yourself. Don't grab her. Don't kidnap her. Don't do anything. But you can you can lust or uh, covet or whatever the word is. And it's not a, there's not a penalty for it. Obviously it's immoral. And I think everybody would agree that, you know, lusting after somebody else's wife is immoral, but can do you, does that mean that you're now supposed to um, stone people who, th who think now we're getting into thought crimes? Right. Precisely. Yeah. It, it, it's like a hate crime. You know, uh, I, I now punch you in the nose and, um, that's okay. It's not a hate crime. But uh, if we're different skin colors or different whatevers, uh, one of us is gay and the other isn't, then all of a sudden it's a hate crime? You know, why should it, there shouldn't be any such thing as a hate crime. I mean, there are crime crimes. You know, if somebody punches somebody else in the nose, that's assault and battery and that's a crime. But if a white punches a black or a black punches a white, or it doesn't matter. Uh, it, you know, it, it's always hateful. Except in the boxing match, you know, if we agree to get in the boxing match and I punch you in the nose, you can't sue me because you've agreed to be punched and, and above the belt. What would you say to something like if somebody agrees to be killed and eaten? I think there was a famous story years ago about some guy that wanted somebody to literally cook and eat him and he was going to either pay the person to do or some, there was something involved like that. What would you say to that? Can somebody agree to be murdered or eaten? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. Uh, agreement is very important. Uh, you know, the sadomasochist joke I have, the, um, the, um, uh, the masochist asks the sadist, beat me, and the sadist says, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there were actual cases like this. There were five people that got ruined on an island or some cave or something, and they, they were going to starve. And one way is they'd all starve because they didn't have enough food. The other way is they drew straws and, and, and they all agreed that whoever gets the short straw, the other four will kill him and eat him. That's not murder. It's saving four lives. Otherwise, all five of them die. This way, only one dies. And as long as they agree, I mean, agreement is, is very important. Uh, and my favorite example of this is a thing called voluntary slavery. And I got into trouble with the New York Times about this. What I was trying to do, they were asking me, what is libertarianism? And it was a, a late, I later learned it was a hit piece against Rand Paul because he was running for office in 2015. And they, they, they weren't getting it or they were purposely not getting it or they wanted to have a gotcha movement. So I said, look, uh, the only thing wrong with slavery is that it was coercive. If it was voluntary, you still have to pick cotton and sing songs and eat gruel and they can whip you, but it's okay because it was voluntary. And then I gave the following case. I said, look, suppose my son, God forbid, has a horrible disease and it'll cost 20 million to cure him. And you're very rich and you've long wanted me to be your slave. And I teach you economic lessons or pick cotton in your plantation. And if you don't like it, you can whip me and kill me. And you're not, you're not guilty of assault and battery or murder. So we make the following deal. Give me the 20 million. I'll give it to my son's doctors. They'll save his life. I benefit because I value his life more than my freedom. 
You benefit because you value my servitude more than the 20 million. You're very rich. So here we have another voluntary uh, interaction. And if you say, well, this is illicit, then my son dies. Because I don't have any 20 million to save him, and, and I value my son's life more than my freedom. A lot of parents would feel that way, that they would uh, not only uh, uh, sell themselves into slavery, but die uh, to protect their kids. And I think that's a, a very good human emotion. And uh, yet, you know, uh, people couldn't distinguish between that. Uh, they, and by the way, this is a very controversial issue among libertarians, uh, voluntary slavery. And, and there, are other there are other very controversial uh, views within libertarianism. For example, uh, abortion. Murray Rothbard is pro-choice. Ron Paul is pro-life. And you can't get two more prestigious leaders of our movement than Ron Paul and Murray Rothbard. And yet they're at opposite ends of, of the spectrum, pro-life, pro-choice. And then you have, uh, what is it, um, um, uh, immigration. Uh, some people say open borders. Bumper Hornberger says open borders. Other people say, well, no, not so fast. Uh, Hans Hoppe would say we should regulate it a little bit. Uh, so there are, uh, there are debates over Israel. There are debates within the libertarian movement, but happily, we're not a cult like the Ayn Rand cult. We're one little disagreement and you're kicked out forever. Right. Whereas Ron Paul and Murray Rothbard um, were friends for decades. And yet, uh, you know, they disagreed. So, look, you and I might disagree on a few issues, but we could still be friends. And you know, nobody's kicking anyone else of the movement because, you know, you disagreed with me on on, on one little thing and you're out. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's basically a refusal at a certain point to refuse to engage and sharpen the other person's ideas as soon as you start to disagree. Well, I think that that's actually a feature. That's not a bug of any of any movement. You have to have some disagreement within it or else you're not really a living you're not a live movement that's actually making progress and trying to hash out difficult disagreements. Thinking back, I th was there one thing in this the second book, uh, the list that you read about? Was it the the person who sells his child into slavery or some something like that? Was that a? Mm, I'm thinking of putting in defending three, um, and I'm not sure I'm going to put it in because I might get fired over it. And that is um, a child pornography. Um, uh, again, I'm very poor. I have a son who's uh, five years old, and he's going to die. And uh, somebody wants to put him in a pornographic movie where he'll be raped. Should I allow that? I think so, because I value his life more than uh, anything else. And if I'm a guardian, i got to guard him. And the best way to guard him is to keep him alive. Keep him alive at all costs. Okay, if he gets raped, it'll hurt, and he might have trauma, and we'll have to get a therapist or whatever, but you got to keep him alive. So that would be my view on that, but I'm not sure I'm going to publish that because, you know, th this is very, very ticklish. You know, there are people who, uh, who uh, don't much like uh, child pornography. Now, otherwise, obviously, uh, that's child abuse. But child abuse to save a child's life, it, it seems to me that it's different. Yeah, it seems like you'd get a lot of people talking, screaming moral relativism at a certain point, too. Yeah, now look, I don't favor it, but I favor it to save the child's life, because the child's life is very important. Now, maybe religious people say, well, let him die because he's going to heaven or something like that, but I'm not religious, and um, I want my children and everyone's children to stay alive, and I'll do whatever it takes um, put myself uh, in, in being raped in a pornographic i do that sooner than have the child but if my only choice was to have you know there was this movie sophie's choice she was told that one of her children would have to die and which one you know you, you get into these really nasty situations but we libertarians have to deal with that and if it's to save the child's life but and then you get um, a child porn where there are no children it's just cartoons somebody writes a cartoon about a child getting uh, molested well, you know, that's sort of like chewing razor blades also. Mm -hmm. very, very yucky. But I don't see why they should go to jail for looking at, at cartoons or drawings of children being molested. It's sort of yucky. It doesn't pass the smell test by a long margin. It, you know, it's horrible. And then they say, well, but this will lead to more child abuse. Well, if it does, then then you stop that. Look, people say women wearing miniskirts leads to um, more rape. 
I don't know if it's true or not, but suppose it is. Does that mean women shouldn't be able to wear miniskirts? No. They should wear whatever they want, and the rapist should go to jail or be punished. Uh, another thing that came to mind was, um, I'm not sure how many of the chapters you hear you would consider about, well, I, I guess you have a section, which is a, the section about speech. Um, one thing that I would disagree with would be something like blasphemy, which in the Bible was obviously punishable by death. Even though, and I think the only reason that you and I would disagree on that is because we would have a different opinion on who owns our bodies. Like when it comes down to it, in a very technical sense, I don't believe in self-ownership because there are certain things that I'm not allowed to do with my body, even to myself, but um, it's still consistent with private property rights because now we're talking about a different owner. Like yeah. if, if you own a slave, then you can tell the slave what he can and can't do or where he can and can't go. But if the slave is a free man, then he can do very different things and, and he doesn't have to answer to anybody else. So it's, it's, well, it's, we do agree, I think on the concept of, uh, private property rights, but then hashing out the details. And I think probably there's like a 90, 95% overlap, uh, on what that looks like in the practical day-to-day -day sense. Well, this blasphemy is a very uh, uh, important point uh, to make, uh, and I believe that we're each self-owners, and my understanding is that your position is, yeah, we're self-owners for many, many, many things, but on certain things, the man upstairs owns us all. Mm -hmm. Or we're not necessarily self-owners, we're self-stewards, so we're responsible and we have to give an account at the end. Okay, so I stand corrected, stewards. And there are certain things that God doesn't want us to do. And one of them is blasphemy. Um, on the other hand, you know, I'm not a free speech absolutist. There are certain speech elements that I think should be punished. For example, holding a gun on not even holding a gun on you. Give me your money or I'll shoot you. No, it's just speech. Now, you know, obviously, I'm not going to do that. You know, the whole thing is silly. It's just a, a, a hypothetical example. But if I was serious and I said that, that's a threat. And libertarians believe that not only shooting people, but threatening to shoot them should also be punishable. So I'm not a free speech absolutist. There are certain speech elements that I oppose, namely threats. But everything else, uh, all sorts of blasphemy like that, uh, it's not nice. And, you know, sort of like if you're in a, a, a shul, you wear a, a, a yarmulke. Mm -hmm. If you're in a church and everyone stands, you stand. And if everyone kneels, you kneel. Or, you know, uh, sort of the propriety. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, to, to blaspheme in front of a believer is uh, nasty and, you know, immoral. But should you go to jail for saying... And, you know, the theologians, well... Atheists now say, look, if God is omnipotent and omnibenevolent, why do we have evil? Uh, this is a philosophical uh, dispute. And it's sort of blasphemous. I'm not sure if it is or not, but vaguely blasphemous, because I'm criticizing the very idea of God. You know, because if God is all-powerful and, and all-benevolent, why do we have Hitler? Why do we have, um, uh, you know, uh, Mussolini or, or people like that? So this is an argument that in philosophy uh, departments they discuss, and it is at least a little bit blasphemous because it's criticizing God. And, uh, but you know, even, you know, I used to, I, I now teach it, uh, I now teach at a Jesuit university, Loyola University in New Orleans. I also taught at the College of the Holy Cross, another Jesuit university. And I tell you, they both have philosophy departments and in the philosophy departments, they talk about this stuff. So if you believe, you know, the slippery slope that it's sort of blasphemous, well, then, you know, maybe blasphemy isn't so bad because it's part of the dialogue over the existence of God. People need to understand, uh, just like on any subject, what are the, what are the, what's the spectrum of thought, you know, as wide as possible so that you can understand what truth is and what, yeah. uh, what kind of actions lead to what kind of consequences morally and economically. I mean, that's essential to, I think, any society. There was this case in Denmark five, ten years ago where they did cartoons about the Muhammad uh, 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 cartoons that were blasphemous or, you know. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, they represented him on, yeah, they drew him, yeah. They drew him in, in very bad ways that were objectionable to uh, Bible-believing Muslims. And they killed the cartoonists. Well, you know, 
Uh, it's not nice doing what they did, but it's part of their right to, to draw whatever they want. And it was certainly unjustified to kill them. Yeah, I would agree. Well, my favorite uh, cartoon show on TV is South Park, run by two libertarians. And afterward, they wanted to uh, do the same thing for Muhammad, namely make fun of him cartoon-wise. And they were not allowed to do that because the TV people were afraid that they would be killed and that other people would be killed, not just the cartoonists, but people who work for the, uh, the TV station. Uh, this is very bad. I think, you know, we should defend the right to free speech. Yeah, it's just the definition of what is, what is that? <laughs> Minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all I had. I don't know if there's anything else that you want to talk about. If you want to update people about where they could find more, either more of your lectures or keep an eye out for your book, uh, anything that you'd like to plug. Well, uh, I uh, teach at Loyola University in New Orleans, and I'm always looking for good students. And all four of our econ people in our economics department are all free enterprise. It's true we have our uh, social justice warriors in the sociology department and history and philosophy and all. But in economics, if you come and major in economics, you will have four out of four free enterprise professors. And very few universities can say anything like that. So if you're a high school student or a college student thinking of transferring or your children or your grandchildren are of college age, um, I would uh, recommend uh, very highly coming to study with me and uh, my free enterprise colleagues. I can recommend that very highly too from what I have, when I have witnessed and experienced personally. Uh, thank you. Thank you.